MDC. Um, he is a, uh, a forester. Um, Andrew uh, graduated from the University of Connecticut uh, with a BS in uh, natural science, uh, natural resource management, and also forestry. And um, he also holds forester licenses in both Connecticut and Massachusetts. And he's certified as a uh, soil scientist. Um, for the, uh, the past uh, eight years, uh, he's been a forester with the Metropolitan District Commission at NBC here. And uh, prior to that, he was a watershed forester uh, working uh, primarily in New York City's uh, Crotton uh, watershed. And uh, Andrew and his family live in uh, Litchfield, I believe. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you. Thank right. you for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I'm just going to roll through these pictures. If anybody has any questions, it's, I'm very informal with this stuff. Yeah. Just feel free to raise your hand, and, and we'll just answer questions as we go. It's, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty simple stuff. So here we go. Just a little bit about MDC. Not everybody's aware of exactly what MDC is. MDC is a little bit of a strange animal. Um, it's technically a not-profit municipal corporation. We actually have a state charter. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Um, and, and our job is to provide drinking water and sewer services um, in the basically Hartford region. Um, we're governed by 29 commissioners and we serve roughly eight member towns and then parts of some other towns. You guys are very familiar with the uh, reservoir on the left. That's a nice shot of the Seville Dam and the Barcampton Reservoir. The reservoir holds about 30 billion gallons of water. Um, Neapog, which is down in like New Hartford and Burlington and a little bit of Canton, um, holds almost 10 billion gallons of water. Uh, the neat thing about the MBC is we're currently providing about 50 million gallons a day of drinking water to about 400,000 consumers uh, within, our, within our member towns. Um, out of the Seville Dam itself, if we had to, they could, they could push a little over 40 million gallons a day. Out of that, out of that reservoir, if needed. It's kind of cool. Um, here's just sort of a layout of our water supply system. You can see the Colbert River Lake up the top, West Branch Reservoir, which is over on the on the West Hartland Colbert line there, and of course Bar Campstead and then Neapog. And you can see the pipeline that goes from Seville Dam, kind of under Lake McDonough, and then that heads east over to the water treatment plant at Reservoir Six. Um, that's in the neighborhood of 15 miles on um, that one pipeline. It's a 48-inch it's a pipeline, like I said, that has the ability to deliver around 40 million gallons of water a day, which, which is quite a bit. But Andrew, just, can you talk about the color coding and the uh, Essentially, the pink is MDC owned lands. And then the, the boxes are And then the, oh, in terms of well, drinking water would be the blue, and then green or sort of non-drinking water. And the yellow is just a core. And the brown land, the brown highlighted, that's the actual watershed. So you can see in Park Hampstead, MDC owns quite a bit of their watershed, along with like Tunxa State Forest, which is great. And actually up in Mass, Granville State Forest as well. Whereas down in Neapog, the area west of the Neapog Reservoir, we own very little land. There's quite a bit of development. I know you guys have been down in New Hartford. The Home Depot is in the watershed up there. So we do have some issues with some of the development. Um, the more suburbanization of that watershed than we have up in Heartland, where you know Heartland is very rural, plus MDC and the state of Connecticut own quite a bit of land. So it really, it's great for us. And the quality of the Bar Hansen Reservoir is really pretty much unmatched in this region. It's, it's excellent. It's better quality than Neapog because more land is developed in Neapog. So you have runoff from, again, 202, your home depots, all the different homes, and there's some farms there, and people putting fertilizer in their lawns and all that stuff. All can kind of impact the Neapog River, which is the primary tributary to the Neapog, Neapog Reservoir. But just before I forget, 50 million gallons a day, that's a, Bar Camps is a 30 billion gallon reservoir. When I worked in New York City, the reservoirs over there are providing over a billion gallons a day to New York City. Um, so. New York City could dry up the Bar Hampstead Reservoir in roughly a month, <laughs> with, you know, without any, you know, rains filling it back up. So it just kind of gives you a scale. As much as you look at the Bar Hampstead Reservoir, you know, it's it's close to nine miles long. It's 2,300 something surface acres. You know, it supplies a relatively small population at 400,000 compared to say New York City, which is supplying, you know, around nine million people um, with water. So it's just kind of one of those little interesting. 
So basically, mostly what I'm here to talk about tonight is the watershed management unit. That's what I'm a member of. Um, our job is we're responsible for protecting and managing the land, and our goal is to provide the cleanest water possible to the water treatment plants, which makes a lot of sense to keep it clean here and you know stay better. So in terms of source water protection strategies that we employ, we do a lot of watershed forest management. I spend 90 something percent of my time on strictly watershed forest management stuff. Uh, we have employees who do a lot of water quality sampling of the streams and reservoirs. I mean, they are daily collecting samples from streams and reservoirs. We have full-time lab staff over our water treatment facility, and they literally, 40 hours a week, multiple employees are, are testing these water samples they get delivered, even on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. So it's, it's an important part of what we do. Specifically, what are you looking for? When All kinds of stuff, and what's what's kind of what's kind of interesting about it is if the guys by accident switch a bottle, like say from Phelps Brook to Nipog River, oh. they'll know immediately that they wrote the wrong name on it because there's certain water chemistries from each different Phelps Brook comes out of a pristine wetland down in Burlington, the Nipog River is not as good a quality. So it's pretty, but they they're they're checking all kinds of stuff. They're looking for pollutants, yeah. just yeah. all kinds of stuff. So just to make sure that it's good quality water coming in. Um, again, we have a watershed inspector who goes out and does sanitary inspections of homes and businesses within the watershed. You may have seen him around. His name is Spencer Killian. Um, uh, my boss also reviews you know, land use proposals. So if somebody wanted to put a big golf course in in the watershed in Hartland, you know, usually the town would notify us that something's going on and, and the district would actually, we don't have any authority on it, but we could actually review those plans and maybe make recommendations you know, to the Wetlands Commission here you know, if they were interested in, in talking to us about it. Um, we do respond to spills in the watershed. If a car flips over, I can't tell you how many times on 219 in the winter we've deployed because a car flipped over, you know, coming down, <laughs> coming down the mountain, heading to Fertzville Dam. And we go out and we help mop up the spill along with the volunteer firemen. And if it's larger than that, uh, we have on retainer environmental services companies that come out and, and do a, a completely thorough cleanup. We also have our petroleum tree. You've seen them driving around in DC patrol cars. And we do occasionally We'd like to do more land acquisition when stuff comes up for sale. Land acquisition is very difficult, but we, we would like to do we would like to do more in that department. Here we go. So in terms of staff in our unit, we have my boss, who's a natural resources administrator, myself. Uh, we have a forest tech, um, some logging equipment operators, and also our watershed inspector and the sampling people who literally go out and take thousands of samples <laughs> over the course of a year. So really, my area of expertise is the watershed forest. So forests are the most desirable land used for protecting drinking water. It kind of makes sense. A lot of people, some people refer to it as green infrastructure. So what the forest does for us, for our, for our water supply, is it provides a natural filtration system. Um, buffers the reservoir from pollutants. Uh, intercepts runoff and moderates stream flow and stabilizes soil. You know, if you think about it, if that entire valley was all open agricultural land, grassy, or paved over with homes and, and roofs and driveways and everything, the water would get to that reservoir a lot faster, carry a lot more sediment, and whatever pollutants are in people's yards, dripping out of their cars, on the roads, that kind of stuff. And again, this is why I have a job, this bottom one, this is my favorite one, reduce the cost of water treatment needed. That's a big selling point for having large tracts of forest land and a staff to manage those large tracts of forest land. Because if the water that goes to the filter plant is really, really good, their operating costs are a lot lower. And that's a lot more than they have to pay me, you know, which, which, which makes sense. And again, they bought the land you know, fairly reasonably quite some time ago. So that investment's already kind of been made. You know, essentially, uh, watershed forest management is considered the best line of defense in protecting drinking water at its source. Again, good land management. I think it probably makes sense to everybody here. You know, you look, look at the pictures of the, you know, the forest surrounding the reservoir. It's, it's pretty nice. We have a long-term forest management plan on the property. Every, basically, acre of the forest has been looked at by professional foresters, inventoried, and broken into different forest cover types and put into different 
management units within that plan, and we have a treatment schedule based on conditions within each one of those management units. Now, things can change. New insects and diseases come in, a storm could come and hit a spot, but it's kind of like a roadmap for us when we try to determine what areas we're going to be working on. Again, we look at a lot of different stuff in there, the geology, the soils. There's, there's quite a bit that got into it. We've identified cultural features, foundations, stone walls, you name it, charcoal pits. We have all kinds of things identified within our roughly 30,000 acres that we own, about 25,000 of which is considered quote unquote like commercial forest land. So in other words, it's sort of operable for forestry management, not too steep, not too wet, that kind of thing. So you're saying of the 30,000 acres NBC owns 2,500 of it? 25,000. 25,000 of it is logable? Essentially, is operable. Again, it doesn't make sense to do it all at once. You could never do it all at once. Um, but yeah. Again, the goals of our management plan, watershed protection. That's the first one up there. That's the number one thing. You'll hear me talk a lot about water tonight. Um, Maintain a healthy and sustainable forest ecosystem. Makes a lot of sense. Habitat management, we work a lot with the DEP on, on various wildlife management programs, everything from eagle banding and bears. And I got a call today from DEP. They want to do more with like a bobcat study they're working on. So they're looking to like, you know, follow some bobcats around and, and see, see what's going on with the bobcat population. We've done stuff with grouse, with New England cottontail rabbits. Just goes on and on and on and on. We, you know, we have loons on the reservoir this fall. So, and pretty much the summary of our management plan. And again, this is based on the most recent science of forest management. Is we have a large inventory of mature trees. That's kind of what we found by doing this inventory. Kind of already knew that looking at the place, but when you break the numbers down, you know, that's what we have. We have a large inventory of mature trees. Um, we also realize that the forests need to be regenerated to, to get a continuous cycle of tree cover, which will help protect water quality in the long run. We actually have to increase the amount of harvesting that we were doing prior to when the plan was written. Um, Again, to increase natural regeneration and forest diversity and overall health of the forest ecosystem. Because again, we know that a well-managed, healthy forest is more resilient to pests and disturbances. So if, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase the diversity of tree species and the age classes on the property. Does that make sense? That makes that block of forest more resilient to storms, to fire, to the next insect that comes down the pipe. So if all we had is 25, 30,000 acres of hemlock, probably all of you here have seen some pretty unhealthy hemlock in this region. We have a problem, right? But if we have some hemlock and some oak and some maple and some birch and some beech, we want everything. We want some of everything in every age class. So I don't want all young forest. I don't want all old forest. I want a mix of all age classes and all species as best as I can across the landscape because that makes my forest more resilient and more stable in the long run. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like your stock portfolio. You know, if you have a hundred grand, you don't want to ball, buy all Nike with it. You know, you want to have mix it up in different things because stuff can go up and stuff can go down. It's the same with the forest. If you are logging areas, um, how do you prevent invasive plants from taking over? Yeah, invasives is a tough one. We try to monitor if there's invasives there first. We try to do something about it and we just try to monitor it. The birds are even spreading the invasives on us quite a bit now, too. I mean, we've got pretty remote areas, and you get random stuff. Anybody know what a cork bark tree is? Mm -hmm. Look that one up. It's a strange one from Asia. It's got big fruit that birds apparently love, and someone in New Hartford or somewhere has one in their yard. I've got it in East Heartland and West Heartland in the most remote places you, you'll see in this area. And the birds bring it in because it's a similar fruit to like grape. So wherever you find like grapevine, the birds that were eating at this person's tree somewhere flew in to visit the grapes and started a new colony of this cork bark tree. It's, it's really, it's something. Invasives are a problem, absolutely. Now what's wrong with these trees? Well, essentially they're just not native to the area, it, you know, 
the birds seem to like them, so it's going to benefit the birds, but it's not really something I want because, I'm, again, I'm trying to deal in native plants. So we're trying to maintain a nice, healthy ecosystem here of native plants. That tree is not, not necessarily bad for water quality. It's just not something that I want to encourage. So I spend a lot of time uh, preparing for the timber harvest. Again, the timber harvests are based on the management plan that's already been written. Um, I locate all the skid roads, if there's any stream crossing. I consult with the towns. I've actually come into Heartland Wetlands meetings on many occasions um, and, and, you know, show maps and discuss how the project was going to go. And, uh, you know, we leave buffers along the stream. And then in terms of, like, sedimentation, which is sort of the biggest threat from the forestry operations, we keep a very close eye on the operators. If the ground conditions get too wet or you know, starts to get muddy, we shut them down or have them move to a drier section of the property. When the projects are done, we have them put in water bars or we put them in because we have our own bulldozer. And then we go through afterwards and we seed them with grass, put in any hay bales or silt fence that, that needs to be done. Um, and we monitor those projects after they've been completed to make sure that the biggest threat to erosion on a logging job is always the access system. The wood's not really because there's still stumps in the ground. We don't disturb the leaf litter. But on the skid roads, the leaf litter does get disturbed. There is a possibility for some sediment to flow down those skid roads and get into a brook that goes into the reservoir. We don't want that. So we do put the water bars in, which basically just diverts the water off. And we seed them and, and again, put in silt fence and hay bales where needed. Um, each logging job, we also have a spill kit on site which in case, say, a piece of logging equipment develops a leak in a, you know, a fuel line, uh, we can put absorbent pads underneath that until that line is repaired. And then we bag that up and we have a special process to collect any of that material and then have it properly recycled. Are these mainly clear cuts or do you select the cut? We'll get into that. We do a lot of different kinds of cuts. Um, and it, it, again, it depends on the conditions on site. So, but I'll get into that more in a sec. So, and again, I, I, I physically measure and mark all the trees that get cut, so I spend quite a bit of time on these things. <laughs> and then we put them up to bid, and mostly loggers and sawmills from this region bid on them. We go with a high bid. We do generate some income off this, but this isn't why we do it. Again, we know healthy forests protect water. We've been managing the property. Our first forester started in 1947. And before that, we actually had a Yukon forestry professor write a management plan somewhere around 1920 for our forest in Nepog. And some of that we're still following. So it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so again, professionally managed for probably 70 years now. I don't know if anybody here remembers Irv Hart, longtime Bark Hampstead native. He was the head forester at the district for a long time. Again, the commercial projects, they do, do go out to bid. All foresters and loggers in Connecticut are licensed, and it is pretty closely monitored. So um, fortunately, we have good quality timber on our property. We have very good, very skilled, very responsible logging contractors working on our lands. And again, myself for the forest tech is out there anywhere from one to five times a week, depending on who it is. And, and how the weather is and you know before storms come we know there's a big rain event coming we'll go out there and make sure everything's buttoned up you know for a two-day three-day rain event that kind of thing and monitor it as it goes so we're, we're very concerned you know about about protecting the water quality of our campsite reservoir or Nipun reservoir whatever lands we happen to be working on now here's a picture looking toward east heartland taken from west heartland um, that Lighter area where the, you could see the snow pretty good. That was a sh what's called a shelterwood harvest. That was done somewhere between 2000 and 2005. I forget the exact year. Um, interestingly, I actually just recently remarked that again um, for an overstory removal. What happened in there is, is there was a lot of unhealthy hemlock in there. So they almost exclusively re removed the hemlock and left the maple, the beech, the birch, the oak. Now we have tremendous regeneration in there. We don't have to replant typically in this part of the country. There's, you know, the regeneration is 12 to 15 foot high there. Tulip poplar, red maple, sugar maple, a lot of birch, black and yellow birch, some white birch, a little bit of cherry. So we're going actually back in, in 2018, and we will remove a good portion of the overstory trees that are left to allow that next forest that we established after the 2000 or so cut to go. 
you know, it's in agriculture, you know, they cut the corn at the end of every year and then plant a new crop in the spring or switch it to another crop. In forestry, we do it in stages. So the trees that were removed were over 100 years old. So it's time for us to regenerate that stand. So again, that was called for in our management plan. I'll show some more pictures of the shelter. That's kind of just like an artist rendition of really, really kind of what it looks like, a little closer view. Here's a nice shot. Um, this is a shelter wood that I was involved with several years ago. Basically pre-harvest, we had about 540 trees, five inches or so in diameter and up. They ranged pretty much from five inches to probably 20 to 24 inches, somewhere in there. And then post-harvest, about 35 trees per acre. Now those 35 trees provide seed and provide shelter from sun and wind to what you hope to be your next forest. And as that next forest gets established and starts to grow, you have the option of either fully releasing those trees by coming in and removing the overstory trees or just kind of allowing it to go on its own. So you kind of have a mix of some younger age classes with some older age classes. And depending upon the site, sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. You know, it just sort of depends what's going on there. So there we kind of get that concept. That's, that's a very common harvest type that we're doing on the MDC right now. Just if you'll let the, uh, uh, some of the old trees that fall in a storm, do you let them stay in there? Too? Oh yeah, yeah. I have no problem with letting trees just go to be this big. It's fine with me. You know, in many cases, some of these, I'll never step foot in them again. You know, we're just gonna let it go, see what happens. I mean, some of those oaks will cruise to 250, 300 years old. Why not let them, you know? The, uh, a variety of wildlife uh, is dependent on the dead wood. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering, how do you take that into account? <clears throat> OSHA would like all dead trees to be cut, but most of the operators who work on NBC property have harvesters. And the reason OSHA would like that to be cut, because a lot of loggers are killed every year by dead trees that fall on them as they're removing live trees around them. In the case of the NBC, if it's not a safety issue, we encourage them to leave those trees. We actually create standing dead trees. I'm currently working with Connecticut Autobahn on about 600 acres in Heartland of harvest where I have specific recommendations for birds written for me that I've implemented in these timber sales. Um, one of the recommendations, they want us to leave at least 10 standing dead trees per acre, which is harder to do than it sounds when you get out there because <laughs> there's only one or two in a lot of cases. So we actually deadened unhealthy trees so by girdling unhealthy trees to create more wildlife trees another recommendation was to try to leave like mass bearing trees like oak mass would be like acorns that kind of stuff so i left as many large diameter oaks as, as i could in there the loggers are not happy there's huge oaks all over the place in there that we left specifically because that was a recommendation of audubon again we're not doing this to generate income you know we do generate income but that is not why we're doing it so we do more for wildlife habitat and water quality than we come close to on the income, income side of things. You could manage this completely 180 from what we're doing if you're looking to generate income. So pretty neat. Again, the, the whole thing, making the forest more resilient and able to withstand disturbances, that's, that's huge for us. You never know when a hurricane's gonna come, what is the next insect that's gonna hit Northwestern Connecticut? I don't know. Do you guys know? I mean, it has changed so much since I got out of college. There's insects I never knew a word about that are impacting my daily decision making. I didn't graduate that long ago. <laughs> Been a while, but not that long ago. Forest health is a huge problem. Um, you just talked about the cut on sunset. That stand was infested with hemlock woolly adelgid and hemlock elongate scale, both non-native Asian insects of Asian origin that have devastated hemlock in southern New England. Um, we're dealing with that every day. The stand you're looking at in here, I ended up salvaging, that's over in Colebrook. It was, you know, 70, 80% mortality and just a, a disaster. Uh, beach bark disease, you know, you guys remember when you were younger, beech trees were smooth, nice shiny gray bark. Now it's all pitted and black and craggy. That's beech bark disease. Another one, that one's actually from Europe, came in from Maine, from like, uh, 
uh, popsicle stick and tongue depressor factory up in Maine, if you could imagine, toothpicks, the craziest thing. Because they brought beach logs over from Europe for a sawmill in Maine, and it's since spread from Maine this way. Beach bark disease is a bad one. Emerald ash borer, you guys might have heard something about that. Again, when I was in college, nobody even ever heard Emerald Ash Borer. It wasn't discovered in the United States until, I think it was around 2003 or 5. Um, our management plan was written in 2007. They didn't even mention Emerald Ash Borer because Emerald Ash Borer was still out in the lake states. Next thing you know, it jumped Ohio. It's in Pennsylvania. It's in New York. It's in Massachusetts, Connecticut, just like that. So I'm salvaging a lot of ash now as well. Um, Southern pine beetle is another one that's not going to be a huge threat for us because it attacks a lot of species we don't have much of. But do you guys remember in the 80s or 90s around here, uh, red pine, the state of Connecticut, the NBC, private landowners, anybody who had red pine, most of it was planted by CCC. Red pine scale came in and wiped out the red pine in the region. So it's just there's always something with the forest health. Obviously, before any of our time, the chestnut blight, you know, Hartwood, I can still show you places in Hartwood where we have standing dead giant chestnuts. They're still out there. And chestnut blight was, you know, 1900 to by 1920, chestnut was largely gone from this area. A lot of it was salvaged and a lot of it just was killed off by the chestnut blight. Was there a lot of elm too? In places that the, the elm disease, that was more of a street tree problem, less than a forest problem. It did affect trees in the forest, but it really raced through the street trees. And that's where it got a lot of publicity. But, but the chestnut was a true forest tree. And you know, if there was one tree as a forester I would not want to lose in northwestern Connecticut, it, it would be the chestnut. Mm -hmm. I mean, durable wood didn't rot, was great firewood, the chestnuts were great for wildlife, it seeded readily, squirrels and chipmunks and birds would move the seed all over the place. It was just like the super tree of this region. And of course, that's one of the first ones we lost. <laughs> Unfortunately, but you know, there's a lot of work being done on that. We actually just helped the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station plant an acre of chestnut trees down on NBC lands in Burlington, Connecticut, in about an acre and a half or two acre plot. We'll see. There's, they're, they're constantly working on it, so maybe they'll get it. I have a different comment, but just as an observation, a couple of years ago we had a woman come in uh, to talk to us about that program. Uh, yeah. Uh, about the chestnut trees. Was it Sandy Agnostakis? Yeah. Dr. Agnostakis? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's the one who, she brought us the trees and we all planted them. Yeah, she's great. It's fascinating. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. My question for you is, I, I've got hemlock on my property, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll say, it's hard to tell, 15, 20 years ago, um, I had adulters that were showing up for several years, and then I haven't seen any sign of them since. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, at the time, you know, I They've been successful in, you know, introducing a predator of it or something like that, or, or is it just on lock on cycles? But I haven't seen any sign of a delegates probably for 10 or 15 years. That's good. There's a couple things going on. One is cold winters knock the adelgid way back. So if you look at the line, just or hemlock goes way up into Vermont to New Hampshire and Maine. If you look at the line of infestation by the woolly adelgid, it stops as you start gaining elevation in those states where it starts to really transition from approximately what the weather is in West Heartland. To Southern Vermont and West Heartland are very similar. You get up into Central Vermont, New Hampshire, where you start gaining an elevation, it's significantly colder. The Adelgid has not penetrated into Northern New England. Cold winters, it literally, you can have a 90 or better percent mortality. And by cold, all you need is a day or two where temperatures drop down close to zero. And that can knock it right back, but then a lot of times they, they kind of slowly build back up all the time. The Ag Experiment Station has also released, it's called the Ladybird Beetle, and it does predate on bullion delta. So you may be lucky because they've released some at Punxas and NBC. So you might get lucky that some of those beetles made it over to your property. The outlook for chest for hemlock in this region, in my opinion, is not great, but on the better sites, it seems to be holding its own. So in other words, this site in Tolbrook was a high, dry, shallow soiled, rocky ridge. The trees were just battered. You know, we had that drought a few years ago, gets a lot of wind, it's very exposed. As I walked north and down a little bit into a cool ravine area, they look great. And look great. Literally a few hundred feet 
from this area where there was a high percentage of mortality. You walk into a little bit of a different site, a little better soils, a little cooler, a little more protected, you're fine. So, but you go much south of this area in Connecticut, and the hemlocks are largely gone. Southern Connecticut, they're largely gone. If you, if you do see a beach, a beach yeah. land, it depends, and there's multiple schools of thought on that. Um, it, it just kind of depends. A, a lot of it, I will, if I'm in there doing a harvest, a lot of times I will salvage it, I will take it. Um, it's a very slow death for the beach. <laughs> They're a slow going, growing tree to begin with, and it takes decades for the whole complex of the disease to occur. But it was, does it spread rapidly? I mean, the beach tend to have Correct. A yes, it, family. It, it's, it's, <laughs> It's hard to go wandering around and not see beach bark disease. Just, it's just a, ca a case of how bad it is on that particular tree. Some of the trees look pretty good, mm -hmm. but if you look at it really close, you can see it's kind of in the early stage. Well, by cutting it, would you be preventing it from going to the other? It's so, it's so prevalent, there's really not much you can do about it. Yeah, there really isn't. A, you know, and again, a beach is a good tree. It's a native tree. Mm -hmm. A lot of animals like the nuts from the beach. They say beach is second in terms of mass to oak mm -hmm. acorns because there's a lot of beach around. Bears love beech nuts. I mean, everything seems to like them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. This is just a picture of a salvage harvest. So there was a bunch of hemlock there that we removed. We left all the white pine and we left all the oak. We just removed the hemlock in that particular site. Uh, here's one where, where down at Neepog Reservoir, we had just a stand of pure hemlock all along by Neepog Dam. It all died. It was falling in the water. They were washing up on the spillway of the dam. So we ended up clearing all of those. And we actually replanted in that case just because it was so close to the water. Um, we did uh, bald and burlap spruce and white pine trees. And it, it's, it's doing pretty well. And a lot of native hardwoods have seeded in. We're really lucky in the fact that the forest just comes right back here. You know, it really just roars back. We, we very rarely have to plant. Most of the planting we've done has been like experiments like with the chestnut planting, things of that nature. Um, here's just sort of a slide. Here's, here's some forest products that can come out of this region. I mean, everything, veneer, dimensional lumber. This is a sugar maple floor. This could have come out of Heartland. You, ne you know, you never know. Um, wood chips get used for oriented strand board, playgrounds, even sawdust gets used, so really, Almost 100% of the saw log gets used. The bark gets used for bark mulch around your homes. It's amazing how crafty the forest products industry is in terms of using everything. You know, they make pallets out of one thing and sell you a kitchen cabinet out of another, and another guy gets the sawdust and is heating his house with it. It's amazing. Um, anybody want to take a guess at what the most valuable MDC forest product is? See if anyone's been paying attention. Water. Water is our most valuable forest product. It just, it just is. And I would argue that it's the most valuable forest product anywhere, not just for us because we're a water company. Because we all need the water. Here's a picture of uh, Charlie Legas, a forester for Hinman Lumber down in Burlington. Hinman Lumber has been in business a long time. Over the years, the district's sold millions of board feet of lumber to Hinman Lumber. Um, Logs also go up to Canada on trailers, in shipping containers, and go globally. I've shipped logs all over the world. You know, we had pine logs leave the MDC to go help rebuild after the tsunami back in 2009 or 2010. It's amazing where a forest product can end up. Some of it goes right to your guys' wood stoves. Some of it goes halfway around the world. How does that work out with insect exchange? Yeah, because we're told not to bring firewood into other states. Or very, very good point. Um, many years ago, when I first got out of college, I worked for a sawmill. And one of the things that we did is we sold logs globally, containerized logs. So our crew would load logs into a shipping container. They would have an inspector come. The container would be fumigated, sealed. The inspector would put a special seal on it and the container would be shipped. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, stuff coming this way doesn't seem to be have done as done as well because that emerald ash borer came in on pallet material shipped from overseas. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's how that works. When logs go in a container, 
they get fumigated, inspected, and then sealed. And that seal can't be broken until they get to their destination. And there's a manifest for the ship captain, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. Again, stuff coming this way, I'm not so sure our trading partners, you know, take as much care as we do. So there's no chance that an insect that's bored way inside of a log could actually uh, not be killed by a fumigation? I wouldn't say there's no chance. I'm not an expert on that, but that's the protocol. So, I mean, you know, again, the same people who are telling us that from the government are the ones who are supposed to prevent the insects from coming in. A lot of stuff came on nursery stock many, many moons ago. You know, gypsy moth caterpillar, that's been in the news lately. If any of you guys have headed south or headed like to southeastern Connecticut, they've had major gypsy moth defoliations. You know, that was brought into a laboratory in Boston. A guy was trying to make silk out of gypsy moth. They crawled out of his window. I mean, it just, it goes on and on with these insects and diseases coming from different parts of the world. I mean, that can be a whole, you know, you could get an entomologist from the state and could, you know, give you a three hour talk on all that stuff. It's, 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 it's amazing. We also do a lot of service road maintenance. In Hartman alone, we have probably 15 to maybe 20 miles of service roads. Uh, MDC owns around 5,000 acres in the town of Harlan, so it's, it's a pretty significant holding. Um, so we have a full-time crew that mows, cleans ditches, cleans culverts, regrades, regrades roads, all that kind of stuff. And again, it's important that our roads are in good shape because that's a potential source of sediment for our reservoir. So if our roads are poorly maintained, they're gonna wash out. They're, they're going to cause problems for a reservoir. So we have a full-time crew that takes care of that stuff, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a constant battle. Guys do a really good job, though. We do a lot of stuff with habitat management. I, you know, I mentioned that before. Everything from you know, eagles, bears, bobcats is on the radar now, grouse, and New England cottontail rabbit. Um, to date, there's been 75 chicks on MDC lands that we're, we're aware of. Pretty impressive number. We also stock fish um, in several places, almost 7,000 fish. The biggest fish we put in Lake McDonough for some reason, I don't know who made those decisions up before they put some nice trout in Lake McDonough. So opening day there should be pretty good fishing. One of the biggest management challenges I'm facing right now are the deer, moose to a lesser extent, but the deer browsing the forest regeneration. So we identify a stand that's got a health issue or that's over mature and we go and we plant a harvest, like say a shelter wood. And we do that shelter wood, we expect to get this flush of regeneration. And what ends up happening is the deer eat certain species. They browse them very heavily, like tulip poplar, sugar maple, red oak. So what results is we get a lot more of say black birch, which they don't browse as heavily. It's not that they won't browse it, they just don't browse it as heavily. So it's sort of an unfair advantage that the black birch has. So remember when I told you I want a diversity of species and a diversity of age classes? If all I get is black birch, I really don't have my diversity of species. We build deer fences on MDC property to keep the deer out. Small fences is experience, just to see. And inside the fence, it's pretty dramatic, the species composition versus outside the fence. So in the last several years, we've been ramping up some deer hunting programs, um, which I'll talk about um, now, so high deer populations, they destroy native plant communities, they just do. You know, if you go down to Fairfield County and walk in the woods down there, I mean, you can see quite a distance. There is no understory at all. The reason there's no understory is because the deer are eating all the seedlings. They prevent tree regeneration, which is, you know, a big problem for me because one of the most important things that I have to do in my career is to regenerate an overmature forest. So that's one of the most paramount things that I'm working on, and deer preventing me from doing that. Again, no, no understory. It's not that bad in Harlan, but you go a little bit south of here, it is that bad. But the deer are altering the species that I'm getting. I'm getting regeneration. I'm just not getting the sweep of species that I should be getting. So they really are impacting, they really are impacting our forest around us. And again, if you don't have trees, you have an increased risk of soil erosion you know, water quality, that's our thing. And again, reduce the overall biodiversity. There's a lot of rare and endangered small herbaceous plants, you know, trout, lily, lady slipper, all those things. Deer love those. So when you have high deer populations, you don't see the spring ephemeral flowers like that, which, you know, a lot of people want to see those, and deer will just knock those right back. 
So we're working on a deer management program with Connecticut DEP. They're basically administering a deer hunt on MDC property. Um, in order to get a permit to do that hunt, I was telling some folks before the meeting, we have all the hunters, they apply through a DEP website just like you would to hunt state land. Once they've won, quote unquote, the lottery, our officers actually do a full background check on them. They have to come to a pre-hunt meeting where we you know, read them the riot act, give them a map, tell them all the rules and regs and that kind of stuff. It's kind of a big deal. We actually have to get a permit from the health department in order to have a deer hunt on our property. Um, let's take a look at this fence here. I'll cover that more in a minute. So the picture in the upper left, that was a approximately a 15 acre salvage of hemlock that died down in Neepog. Again, shallow, dry, dry soil. It's a little bit warmer down in you know, New Hartford, Burlington than it is up here, lower in elevation, only about 550, 600 feet above sea level. All the hemlock was dying. They did a salvage. After two years, that's what it looked like. Nothing was growing there but grass. So we erected a deer fence. Within two years, you can see there's trees inside the fence but not outside the fence. And then, you know, several years later, believe it or not, I don't have a laser pointer on me, but you see the tree in the middle and then the one to the right, those are the same as the one to the middle and the one to the right in that 2006 photo. Can you guys see that? You can't even see the fence. The fence is still there. And that happened, we started hunting in 2009. So to build a case to our employer that we really have a deer problem, we really have to do a hunt, we did the exposure fence, because again, you know, picture, it tells a pretty good story. So we've since harvested many, many deer off that property, and the forest is starting to bounce back because we've lowered the deer population. We're not trying to eliminate the deer. We're just trying to reduce the deer population you know, to the point where we can manage the property and, and have a healthy forest ecosystem. Any questions on the deer hunt? It's actually ongoing right now in East Hartland. Does it taste good? Yes. <laughs> What about, so, the, what about so, the moose? Do you do anything with the moose? You know, we can't do anything with the moose legislatively. We just we just keep our fingers crossed that the moose won't destroy. But you, your average white-tailed deer in this region will eat between five and seven pounds a day, I'm told. And that could be acorns, it could be grasses. In late winter, like February, March, heading into April, there's really nothing for the deer to eat. The acorns are under the snow. There's no more grasses. There's no herbaceous plants. So what they do is they come into areas that we've just recently done shelter woods in, and they eat every little seedling. They eat all the buds of seedling. Think how many buds you would have to strip off to get five to seven pounds per deer, 365 days a year. But again, they're heavy on them late winter and in the spring because there's nothing else. In the fall, they're all over acorns. You know, the summer they got grasses. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. But but late winter, especially when there's snow cover, what's sticking up through a foot of snow? My little baby oak. And what gets eaten? My little baby oak. It just, it, that's just what happens. You know, it's unfortunate. And they say moose, 30 to 50 pounds a day. So moose, you know, moose could be a problem moving forward too, but don't worry, we are not gonna bother the moose. <laughs> Some other source water protection programs. Again, raw water samples. Our guys are collecting them seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And some of the lab is analyzing them. Again, we also have the watershed inspector, which I spoke of before, who goes out and just kind of makes sure everything's kosher, you know, within the watershed. Source water protection, again, my boss reviews any sort of big development plans that are going on and comments on those. We don't have any actual authority. But I, I think we have a pretty good working relationship, or at least we try to. We try to be able to leave most of the towns within the watershed. And they let us know what's going on. And if we have any major concerns, you know, we tend to, you know, to let them know what those concerns would be. I talked about spills before. We have a spill trailer. That's actually, we have one in Epog, one in Bark Hampstead, ready to go at all times. Accident, we've had all kinds of crazy stuff happen. Um, you know, oil tanks leak, stuff like that. We respond. We're not always the primary responder. Typically, right away, the primary responders, the local fire departments, your guys' local fire departments are excellent. Um, they do a great job with that, and we try to support them. And again, if, it's, if, if it ends up being a larger spill, which fortunately we've had very little of, we do have an outside contractor who would come in and really stay on it and be supervised by Connecticut uh, Department of Environmental Energy and Protection, actually the whole cleanup process. 
and then the lucky owner of said vehicle that had the spill gets a pretty big bill out of that, I'm told. And again, we've got our patrol to just kind of prevent, to try to limit as much as possible trespass, illegal dumping, that kind of stuff. But we do, we do have some problems with that stuff, so it's important to uh, have patrol out there, try to keep everybody on. And that's kind of the end of my sort of natural resource watershed protection presentation. Um, if you have any questions about that stuff. When you said Bark Hempstead is nine miles long, is that both Heartland section and the compensating red door? No, total from Seville Dam, is, it's eight something miles. Up or down? Yeah, north? Well, from the Seville Dam all the way to the end of the reservoir. What, the top, the yeah. Heartland mm -hmm. section? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Basically so you're up not to counting the Bark Hempstead section? Oh, I'm counting the whole thing. Seville Dam's in Bark Hampstead. Oh, so from right. Seville Dam all the way basically to Route 20 at the north okay. end of the reservoir. But not the compensating section. Correct, not okay. counting. Not the recreation. Okay. Correct. Thank Correct. you. Um, the Canada geese, are they an issue at all in terms of water quality? I haven't seen so many this year for some reason, but I don't know. We don't have a big population of Canada geese on the Bark Hampstead Reservoir because Canada geese require grass they'll get picked off if they go into the woods. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the coyotes and the bobcats will get them. So you'll sometimes see some geese hanging around like the east parking lot because yeah. that's all grass there. And we just try to scurry them out. It's not a huge problem there. However, over at Reservoir 6, if you ever go over there, especially in the winter, right before the ice forms on that place, there's like thousands of them over there. And that is a problem. When I, when I worked in the New York City watershed at Kensico Reservoir, which is down in White Plains, had a lot of grassy areas around it, they actually had their law enforcement officers go out in a motorboat with air cannons on it, scaring the geese off several times a day because there were thousands of geese would show up there. So different places have different strategies. They're the, uh, compensating reservoir too. There are quite a few of them in compensating reservoir. Again, you've got some grass down there, you also have the beach, but at least from our perspective, compensating is not drinking water. So, but yeah, the, the geese, I was just up at a tour at uh, Wachusett's Reservoir, and they have a lot of grass around that. I know they were telling me they had a lot of problems with geese up there. But for Bark Hampstead, it's so densely forested, they try to step into the forest like that, they're, they're not making it. So they need to be out in the open where they can see a threat coming, predator coming. So largely, we don't have a problem with Bark Hampstead Reservoir. You mentioned briefly, um Trespassers, is there much of a problem? Yeah. Like, like mainly what, ATVs or? Um... ATVs, today I actually sent patrol out for a guy jogging into a hunting area with two dogs off leash. I saw him duck under a gate that has a no trespassing sign on it. So. You said he didn't, and he wasn't wearing armor either. And he wasn't wearing armor until he's got two golden retrievers running into a deer hunting zone. It just, yeah, there's, there's a problem for sure. So I don't know why people can't read the signs and understand. Literally, no trespassing means no trespassing down there. They're very serious about it. You know, I mean, you know, we have a full-time law enforcement staff that drives the service roads, and there's cameras up there. When they see stuff, they'll they'll go and respond. So it's sort of a constant thing. But yeah, the the ATV things. Heartland's got a major ATV problem in like Tungsten State Forest, and and they're mucking around in streams that flow into Bar Camps at Reservoir. So it's something we're very concerned about. It's something that I've spoken to the state about at, on many occasions. So that is a problem, and that, you know, efforts to reduce that are ramping up. So we'll see how it goes. I'm just going to say, this is the first year uh, that after the east majority of them took off to go south, I've had 30, 35 geese on my yard or on my pond, and they're there to stay. Yeah. And if the pond freezes over, they move the water. When it thaws, they're back again. Yeah, it's they amazing. they love going over the west branch of the Farmington River. They yeah. love that. Yeah. Now the, the the geese can be a problem. Again, a few geese here and there is fine, but when you get a few thousand of them landed on your pond, it's it's not it's not good. Like I said, Reservoir Six over West Hartford and Bluefield, I've literally seen thousands of them. On that, and, that, and you know, that's not something that you want to save. So, there's no problem for you finding logging groups interested in going in and to your diseased hemlocks and just taking those diseased hemlocks down. We're very fortunate in that we have markets for basically everything. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think that you would, but for some mm -hmm. reason, we do. And kind of the neat part about my job, from my perspective, 
is I get paid to improve the quality of the forest by my employer, and my employer gets compensated for that work. You know, when Wade Cole goes out and fixes up the roads of Harland, obviously the town has to pay him, and the town has to pay for the equipment and the asphalt and the gravel and the culvert pipes. You know, you're paying for that. We get compensated for the value of the timber, so it's kind of nice. So we actually, you know, generate a profit by doing really the best management we can we can do. So it, it it really works out well. And again, some species and some areas we get more than others for. You know, some things are pretty marginal, but if it improves the health of the forest, marginal is worth it. You know, we're not looking to make a, a profit on this stuff. So it's it, it's kind of neat, you know, that we're able to do that. So. So it's uh, after 8.30, and uh, it's maybe one more question if anybody has one. And then, uh, I just have like five cool slides that I know Hank's going to want to see. <laughs> so if I can run through this next. So I'm, I'm digressing from the forest management, watershed management part, and just showing some cool historic slides of Hartwin, Hartwin Hollow. So I'll see if you guys like these. So that's Hartwin Hollow. I think somewhere near her, where Hurricane Brook came into the hollow, that's like 1940. Notice all axes. Mm -hmm. Kind of neat photo. We got a lot of pictures of the guys working back in the day. They're pr pretty neat shots. So this is when the the um, dam was being cleared. Correct. The, the dam the was hollow. under construction. Yeah. Well, and these okay. these guys were were clearing the land because they had yeah. to remove all the trees. I'm told they stumped it and even removed topsoil huh. because they wanted good waterfall. Okay. Because they knew after decades and decades and decades of farming in those floodplain soils. There were nutrients added, you know, who knows what. I, you know, remember, people lived in this valley, so there were lots of agricultural animals in that valley. There were crops in that valley. So they, what they called sanitized at the time, and part of that process was they removed a lot of topsoil from up there. The, the district went above and beyond when they built this reservoir, and, and it shows today. Um, if anybody's familiar with the Coon Club, that was yeah. up in West Hartwins. I actually saw the foundation of it today. That's this photo says bridge near Coon Club, 1935. Mm -hmm. So that would have been over Hubbard River, I presume. So and I'm just yeah, I'm sure had the reservoir not been built, that would not have survived the 55 flood. That's the same Pretty sure. That's the same Coon Club that moved to Colbert. That's correct. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Norfolk, is it? yeah. It's yeah, Norfolk Colbert line. I, I think it's actually in Norfolk. But correct, yep. And I mean, they were up there for a long time before this. How's that one look? Oh, that was actually not too bad. You can't see, but at the top of the screen, it says, this is looking north from a knoll opposite Alfred Cable's farm. And that's 1932. So actually, does that mean anything to you, Hank? Well, Cable had a big farm in, in the yeah. hollow. But even look, you know, look at the hills. Yeah, it looks like yeah. you're looking north there. It, exactly, isn't it neat? Mm -hmm. Especially after looking at, at Hank's mural in there. Yeah. To come and look at these. Pretty right. cool. Yeah, it's where Hurricane Brook comes in and all. Yeah. And then this one, I bet you guys have never seen this before because that bridge has been flooded for you know many many decades now. That was a recently completed state of Connecticut concrete arch culvert bridge that was Connecticut Route 20. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that bridge was completed, the district decided and got approval to build the Seville Dam and flood the thing. <laughs> so that bridge didn't see many years of service, and I'm told that it's believed that that bridge still exists under about 40 feet of water. Yeah, but the bridge, the bridge, the bridge. That's true. Is that right. north of the dam then? It's, it's north of the dam. Do you, do you guys know where 20 comes in from yeah. Like if you're down to the store. It's one on Hill Road, yeah. Correct. It, where 20 hits Center Hill Road, and you would take a left to head up this way. If you went straight, that's at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. Center Hill is at the top up yeah. there. That's, okay. So that, that's right where it is. So again, we, we assume that that bridge is still there because it was concrete. And I'm told we have some pictures of the reservoir starting to fill up and that bridge is still there. So we believe it's still there. We haven't sent the diver down. because I guess we just haven't sent the diver down. But it'd be kind of interesting to see it. I wish I had like a side by side for you. That would be cool. And this right here is a view. This picture was taken from Bar Hampstead on the west side, off of Center Hill Road, Gidman's Ledge, as they call it, looking northeast. So you're looking at, as you're looking up on the right, upper right, that's East Hartland up there. 
And again, that probably those hills probably look probably look pretty familiar. But what's amazing about these photos is this one was late 30s, early 40s. Look how densely forested it is. You know, so pretty pretty neat. This is approximately the location of the overlook that's on 20 on the west side of the reservoir. So right now. You're standing in West Harland looking at East Harland. And actually, if you remember, one of the, the first Shelterwood picture I showed is actually the area you're looking at down there. It just worked out that way. It's kind of neat. And again, look how mature that forest appears. You can see some trees planted in the valley. I don't know if those were planted by CCC. If those were, if that was someone's Christmas tree plantation, I would tend to doubt that, but it's possible because they are in pretty tight rows but you can see there is still some agricultural activity down in the valley at that time. You can see some open fields and whatnot. But largely the hills are forested. You know, a lot of these hills have charcoal pits on them and have a long time use as more of a woodlot than an agricultural site. Because again, everybody, everybody needed a lot of firewood. And the farmland was all down in front of the mall. Correct. Exactly right. And, they, and, and, that, and that, you know, that's what happens when someone decides to build a reservoir, someone else loses their farm. Yeah. Because the best land is those floodplain soils along the river. Yeah. That happened all over the place in the Catskills, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, you know, the district didn't buy outright these lands, and largely, I'm told, people accepted it and, and moved on. Uh, I know there's some pretty nice farms that are you know, now underwater because of it. Again, there's a brand new installed guardrail up by the Overlook, again, West Hartland. Um, I believe that was right about 1940. So pretty neat shots. The hills kind of walked down on that one. Now, MDC built the road around, right? State, Wasn't that part of the deal? I, I believe the state built it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting that they went all the way around. Because if you think about it, either the state of Connecticut or the MDC owns everything going north. Like, I always wonder why they didn't just stop at, like, Milo Co. Because it would have been a considerable expense to bring it all the way around from Milo Co. all the way to, say, like the Salt Shed and the Wilderness School. You know, there's a whole swath in there that it's just everything is owned by either well, state or the MDC. Hardman wouldn't be connected. Hardman, I'm not Correct, it would be separated. I, yeah. I thought it was part of the deal. I it may, it may have been. Know, uh, yeah, it may have been. In order to uh, buy out the land. Because, I mean, we did, we, did basically, just, we did basically take 20 away and a brand new bridge, so it could very well be. Yeah. Oh, and that was my last one. But I just thought they're kind of cool. Yeah. And since Hank was doing the mural tonight, I thought it'd be neat to add a couple, yeah. a couple more you. photos in. Well, yeah, just to add to that. Thank you. So thank you very much.